This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 371 was produced on April 13th, 2023. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one-stop shop for all green energy investors. Best-selling author and Bear Traps Report editor Larry McDonald returns as this week's feature interview guest. Larry and I will discuss the upcoming debt ceiling debate and how it will play into Federal Reserve policy, as well as the outlook for energy markets and energy stocks. And I'm Patrick Serezna with the Macro Scoreboard week over week as of the close of Wednesday, April 12th of 2023. The S&P 500 was up 0.2%, closing at 4127. We'll take a closer look at that chart and key technical levels to watch in the postgame segment. The U.S. dollar index was down 0.3%, closing at 101.53, another short-term breakdown towards 2023 lows in reaction to the FOMC meeting minute details. The May WTI crude oil contract up 3.3%, closing at 83.26. Crude oil remains on fire. We'll look at that chart, and Eric will have the EIA inventory data in the postgame. Gold down 0.5%, closing at 2025 stalled uh, on the week-over-week advance, but the bull trend remains intact. Copper up 2.3%, closing at $4.08. The week-over-week advance has copper approaching the March highs for a potential breakout. Uranium uh, flat on the week at 51.10, and the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield up 9 basis points, closing at 340 points. The key news to watch on Friday is the release of the retail sales and the universal University of Michigan consumer sentiment. And next week, we have the first big wave of corporate earnings and the Empire State Manufacturing Index. Now, this week's feature interview guest is Bear Traps Report editor Larry McDonald. Eric, why did we get Larry back on the show this week? Patrick, Larry has been a listener favorite, and it was a listener request that we get him uh, back on the air, sent in to us at requests at macrovoices.com. And uh, we looked it up, and it had been quite a while, so we decided to do so. Well, Eric's interview with Larry McDonald is coming up as Macro Voice continues right after this message from our sponsor. If you invest to bring about a world powered by green energy, you should meet Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy that serves as a one-stop shop for green energy investors in Europe. Respect Energy brings together independent power producers, accredited and institutional investors holding assets in renewables, or undertaking investments in new green energy production, such as wind and solar photovoltaic power plants. More than 600 institutional and accredited investors have already entrusted Respect Energy with the sale of their electricity production, portfolio management, O&M services, EPC, and project development. If you want to invest in green energy in Europe with the help of a trusted partner, contact Respect Energy today and ask for a tailor-made solution. For more information, visit respect.energy. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is New York Times bestselling author and Bear Traps Report founder, Larry McDonald. Larry, it's great to get you back on Macro Voices. It's been too long. I want to dive right into Fed policy, but with a twist. I've been talking to a lot of guests recently about this balancing act the Fed has gotten itself into, where they're kind of backed in a corner now to where you know they, they, they need to hike in order to fight inflation, yet they need to cut in order to prevent markets from uh, having a meltdown here. 
it seems to me there's a whole other dimension to this this conundrum that very few people are even talking about, which is we've got a debt ceiling showdown coming up this year, and it's going to be, I think, more interesting. I think the fireworks will be more interesting in an environment where Fed policy is already constrained. So how does the debt ceiling factor into monetary policy? Well, it's what's amazing about it is you have – a dynamic toward the middle of the year of 2023, where you're going to have about $1.2 trillion of treasury issuance in arrears that are going to have, treasury is going to have to get caught up. And because right now, Janet Yellen and and her team are really suppressing issuance because of the debt ceiling, and all of that issuance is going to have a colossal catch up from late July, early August, all the way through the end of the year. And then there's the normal financing period. And so this is a dynamic that is is so powerful, I think, that if the economy turns, which we think it's going to, we could see the Federal Reserve uh, in yield curve control, QE, by the fourth quarter, because there's just so so many bonds that have to be sold to the public. What would that mean if we're trying to fight inflation and we're forced into a, a situation like that? Well, that's that's the thing is that if you're trying to fight inflation, the way I look at the dollar is that if the Fed is cutting rates, right, or doing QE and the rest of the world is improving, that sets up for a much weaker dynamic. So the way you look at the dollar is it's what the Fed is doing relative to all the other central banks in the world. And then it's, then you have to think of, OK, what's the U.S. economy doing relative to the rest of the world? And so if the rest of the world is coming out of COVID, coming out of the war, if we get some type of detente in the war and, and we clearly have a global reopening, then you have a, a, a dynamic where if the Fed is doing QE or yield curve control in the fourth quarter of 2023 or the first quarter of 2024, it does set up for you know a much weaker dollar, which will, you know, kind of gets into our core thesis is that in all the previous regimes, the Fed's been able to get inflation back down to two percent or below, right? This time, the probability that we get stuck in a three to five percent inflation range for a long time is extremely high, and what that means for for people listening to us right now, you need a whole new portfolio construction than the previous decade's darlings, right? The previous decade was really a deflation setup where deflation and disinflation empowered financial assets like bonds and tech stocks and growth stocks. Now, if if you're stuck in that kind of more sustained inflation regime, you need to be a whole new basket of investments, value stocks, maybe European equities, emerging markets, but more value and hard assets than financial assets. Now, you're talking about yield control and QE by the end of 2023. That sounds like it means a mountain of new treasury issuance. Is that right? And what are the implications? Yeah, so it comes out to about $1.2 trillion of, of issuance that they're going to have to do a massive catch up. Because right now, we've already done, in the first six months, the CBO said today, Eric, that we're going to have right now a $1.1 trillion deficit in just six months. So that means we're on a pace for potentially $2 trillion deficits in a year. And that's on the heels of of last year and and previous years of $2 trillion deficits. So it's just the people are forgetting how much we need we need China. We need the rest of the world to buy our treasuries. But we also now have Europe sell, trying to sell more bonds than ever. Asian countries, emerging markets are all selling more bonds than ever. And so th- there's no, no question that the Fed is going to get forced into some type of yield curve control because the social promise is just look at the Inflation Reduction Act as well as the, the, the infrastructure bill that the, the Biden, those are the, the Biden team's two primary, you know, pieces of legislation. And you have a Republican kind of freedom caucus that 
is going to try to put on a big show here toward the middle of the year. And, and then you've got Speaker McCarthy that's going to try to do a deal. But this, you know, I, I sympathize with Speaker McCarthy. This is a guy that had a tough time, you know, getting in the seat, right, where he, he, he didn't hate, he does actually some enemies inside the Freedom Caucus. So the probability that we run into some, you know, some more, some of this fiscal tension, because if the GOP tries to stop the Democrats and, and their spending plans, and, and you've got some of these Freedom Caucus people that are, you know, very altruistic and want to make a political stand, uh, it really sets up much worse, a much more violent transaction than even 2011, which, if you remember, President Obama got forced into the sequester finally, but that was when Moody's, I think it was S&P, threatened to downgrade the United States. Let's talk a little bit more about that scenario, because it seems to me that if ever there's been a political environment that was ripe for somebody to uh, cause trouble, uh, we've got it with with everything going on politically. We've got the the charging or indictment now of of, uh, former President Trump, which has infuriated the the GOP. And of course, the the Democrats have, you know, are ready for having their lynch mob or whatever is, is coming next. It seems to me like every time in the past we've built up this complacency where people said, wait a minute, if we get to that debt ceiling and we don't pass a, an extension and we, we default on just one treasury payment, it's going to affect the United States credit rating forever. We can't let that happen. So far, we've never let that happen. It, it's gotten to the 11th hour and then finally somebody you know, makes a deal and, and just before there would have been a default, they end up not defaulting. What if we end up defaulting this time? Seems to me like the, uh, the mood is ripe for that to happen. Yeah, what, what they'll probably do is when you come down to the end of, of Janet Yellen's what we, should, what we call extraordinary measures, and we're going to come down to a June 30th, that's the key, the key date, uh, of when those extraordinary measures may run out, what they'll start to do is they'll start to say, okay, they'll look through the fiscal responsibilities and they'll start to pick and choose things that can, things that can be postponed or things that can be kind of pushed out. And that what will happen is during the Obama years, the Obama team, I think, worked behind the scenes with the rating agencies and the rating agencies really pushed hard on the Republicans. So the whole thing was politicized where the, the, the administration will want to make the Republicans look bad, right? I wouldn't blame them, right? So you're gonna, they're going to be working with the rating, rating agencies behind the scenes. And as they start to have to pick and choose where they're going to have to default, that's where um, the rating agencies are probably going to have to step up and then try to f- enforce some muscle on the Republicans. And that probably happened sometime in July, as it did in 2011. (laughs) Larry, let's talk about magnitude and scope of where we are in this story, because for years and years and years, we were just uh, all in this mood of, wow, we can't believe how long the bond bull market has lasted. We've got super low interest rates. But boy, if we got ever got back to normal interest rates, a lot of people predicted that would be the point where the borrowing cost would cripple the federal government and it would be all over. You know, the doomsday bloggers said that would be it. The, the, you know, everything goes up in smoke at that point. Well, everything hasn't gone up in smoke, but we have gotten to the point where we're back to normal interest rates. What has happened to the federal government's balance of payments? How much are we spending on interest and how does that relate to how much we can afford to spend on interest? Well, that's the big, you know, that's the big bombshell for the fourth quarter of 2023 is that this, you're going to have this big awakening around, first of all, as the economy softens and right now most of the street has started to take down gross domestic product estimates because of the banking crisis and because of the commercial real estate stresses, right? So that's potentially a threat to tax receipts which have been strong over the last couple of years. But if, so if you get tax receipts uh, a touch lower and then you've got interest rates because the Fed forced that front end of the curve up near 5%, your interest expense is, is going to go up near $1 trillion uh, on a run rate of interest expense. And then your interest on excess reserves have to be paid. So those two things combined we're going to force 
a uh, tremendous amount of, of issuance from the Treasury uh, that, as Greenspan said uh, years ago, at some point you, you get a crowd out where Treasury issuance of, of, of bills and notes starts to crowd out the corporate issuance. And so you've got so much borrowing that comes from the federal level that this huge wall of 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 maturities that are going to start coming in in 2024, 25. One of the big things that 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 one of the blessings of the COVID period was that because the Fed was so accommodative, a lot of these companies were able to extend out maturities and issue lots of paper in 2020 and 21. And so that maturity wall, that colossal beast of a maturity wall that is in, you know, the corporate bond market, especially in high yield, that that got pushed out to 2024-25. And now that's coming right into the jaws of this massive amount of issuance of treasuries in in the fourth quarter. And that's once, once again, that's another thing that probably forces the Fed into some type of advanced QE or yield curve control because they're just going to really cut off the corporate bond market. And there's a lot of zombie companies that really had access to capital for so long. You know, Eric, when you suppress the cost of capital for longer and longer, longer periods of time, you enable companies to, to be profitable with an unrealistic financing level. So this starts to really hit corporate earnings uh, in the first, second quarter, third quarter of of next year, as those interest costs on the corporate level uh, go up uh, dramatically. I want to focus on this idea of a a Greenspan crowding out, particularly as it respects to high yield bond issuance, because so many of us have been waiting for so many years for junk bonds to crash. And we've made all these arguments saying, you know, look, this is crazy. At one point, you actually had negative yielding junk bonds in Europe. Uh, I don't think those exist anymore. But needless to say, we went through some crazy periods there. Seems to me like if you're going to hit the market with a wall of new treasury issuance at a time when Russia and China are definitely not buyers. Why would anybody be bidding anything for junk bonds at that point if you've got nice, attractive yields on treasuries and they've got more than they can sell? Yeah, that's the thing. When when treasury yields get this high, your your risk-free rate is so attractive relative to equities, relative to junk bonds, uh, and, and that's exactly why the Fed will be forced to cut rates dramatically by the end of the year, because the, the rates are so high. And the, like I said, your interest costs are going to go up to, you know, during the Obama years, we had interest costs of less than $200 uh, billion a year. And now we're going to be uh, at over a trillion a year plus interest on excess reserves. So one of the f- fallacies kind of over the last couple of years, especially the last 12 months, is when the Fed and, you know, Bill Dudley and the Fed's kind of pawns in the market talk about, you know, 6% Fed funds or 5% Fed funds forever. It's so disingenuous because if you do the math, the Greenspan crowd out that you're talking about, if you keep interest rates here for so for longer periods of time, not only is your interest cost a trillion dollars a year just for interest, and that's starting to crowd out corporate borrowing also, Medicare and defense, you know, that trillion dollars is bigger than the defense budget. So it's really a fallacy that the Fed can just say the Fed's trying to fight inflation, Eric. Everybody knows that, right? But if you're going to try to keep that front end of the curve here for that long, you're going to crowd out, you're going to crowd out the corporate sector, you're going to crowd out uh, defense spending, and you're going to get a tremendous political pushback on Capitol Hill. So that's where the Fed gets forced into at least 100 basis points of of rate cuts, probably by the fourth quarter of this year, first, second quarter of next year. I certainly hear you on how they could be forced into cuts, but hang on, they need to fight inflation and those cuts are 
going to result, I would think, in inflation really starting to run away at that point. Uh, at what point do you get to and how can we as investors know how that fight is going to go down between we've got to fight inflation no matter what versus we've got to cut rates in order to accommodate the, the market? What, what's going to happen uh, or, or how will we know who's going to win the, the, uh, the political battle? Well, the good news is, is, is that inflation, the Fed's going to be able to, to pull out the sales pitch because inflation is coming down at a, at a rate that looks like, wow, this is like you can make the case. I mean, I think the, the Fed's going to look like Michael Jackson doing the moonwalk the second. And as we saw this in the last couple of Fed meetings, he mentioned disinflation, uh, I think, something like you know 50 times or something like that you know chair Powell so the moment you get some disinflation which we're already getting because of the banking crisis and because of the commercial real estate crisis uh, and the contraction of lending the Fed will embellish uh, or exaggerate the propensity of inflation to keep to keep on that down train you know that down plane. But like you said, where you're, you're bringing up the most important point of this conversation, the problem is when you're doing this from a higher level and the rest of the world is normalizing, and that's where the dollar comes into play, if, if China's in a better spot and Europe's in a better spot and the Fed and the U.S. is weakening, that change in monetary policy toward cutting rates or QE, uh, that, that dramatically weakens the dollar. And that puts you into like a 1968 to 1981 inflation regime where instead of it normalizing down to 2% or below, that now we're going to normalize at this higher plane because of the political, all the political ramifications that have come out of all this spending since the COVID dynamic, whether it be the Inflation Reduction Act or the, the infrastructure plan. We're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars in new spending. And that is what creates a whole new need for a 20, you know, a, a new portfolio for the next decade. So the portfolio that worked from 2010 to 2020 uh, doesn't work anymore. And the portfolio from 2022 to 2028 is much more of a hard asset emerging markets and value equity portfolio that that's probably going to work much better. Larry, I want to move on to energy markets, which are near and dear to my heart and I know to yours as well. You tend to look at the energy markets more from the perspective of the equities, the actual oil and gas companies, as opposed to trading the commodity itself, as I do. Give me some perspective on what you see going on for the oil and gas sector, because you know, even if I think the commodity price is going up, which I do, I can also see that the industry is still facing a very unfavorable government attitude problem, at least in the United States. And in general, uh, my observation is that the, the people in the world that are obsessed with climate have their heart in exactly the right place, but they're trying to phase out fossil fuels before phasing in the viable replacements that will provide us with clean energy. And it seems to me like it's a pretty hostile environment for making a buck in the energy business, given all the, uh, the government pressure and environmental pressure that exists. What do you see on the horizon for oil and gas? Well, we, we've got this incredible dynamic, Eric, around, you know, a unipolar world versus a multipolar world. So if you think of like the last 20 years, the U.S. always had either China or Russia, one of the two, in their back pocket. And to some extent, even the Saudis as well. So you think of the Saudis, the Russians and China. One or two of those three have been really in the back pocket of whether it be the Clinton administration or it be the Reagan years, whether it be the Obama years. There was a, a unipolar world where we always had one or two of those uh, as, a, as a close ally. And now, you know, we, we kind of are coming into a period where multipolar world where those potential three or definitely two of the three are not cooperating with different different parts of our government. And what that means, if you think of like when we went into COVID, the Russians and the Saudis have had actually almost you know a big fight and they were actually increasing oil production. And, and so 
that helped create a disinflationary force. So there's been these disinflationary forces the last 10 years, and a lot of it came out of the natural progression of a unipolar world where where the, the, the Saudis were playing ball, the Saudis and the Russians weren't on the same team. Therefore, they, they actually did a lot of things in terms of increasing production at the wrong time that created the oil went up to, to negative, which is ridiculous. And, and that created dis, disinflation and deflation. Now, you know, they've learned from those mistakes. It's much more of like the Saudis and the Russians are on the same page and they're coordinating. So they have much more power and control over oil prices than they ever had before. And so as you go in toward a recession now, in the old days, the last 15, 20 years, if you went toward a recession, oil prices would go way down. Uh, now, because, as you said, because of environmental restraints and because of capital discipline that now exists within the big oil companies, there's just not enough investments there. So the Saudis and the Russians who are working together, it's much more than they ever have, even with the Chinese, they have a much better control over the oil price so they can actually keep it at a higher plane. That's, you know, that's once again, that gets into your more sustained inflation regime, inflation that normalizes between three and five instead of one and two. What does this mean for M&A in the energy business? Are we going to see more consolidation of companies? Yes. Yeah, so we we run a model and uh, at the Bear Trap Support, we have a live chat with about 650 institutional investors in 23 countries. So these are buy side, these are hedge funds, mutual funds, and pension funds. And we run a live conversation during the day. And one of the things that clients are talking about is the energy, the, 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 the reserves at, say, your Chesapeake's, your range resources, your Southwestern energy, your reserves of the smaller companies versus the market caps, those reserves are much in a much, the companies have much have a much better value than they've ever had before on the smaller side of, of the, of the say, think of, think of the majors versus the minors, right? So the amount of natural gas and oil and gas that the smaller companies have in reserves relative to their market cap is, is much greater than previous cycles. And then you take on the fact that because of from the regulatory point of view, how difficult it is to explore and find new assets and new reserves. It, if you're the main, if you're if you're Chevron and Exxon, you know, five years ago together you had maybe six billion of cash, right? Now you've got forty to fifty billion between Exxon and Chevron. You got a lot of cash, and you you see all of these assets around the world. Your Southwestern Energy, your Chesapeake's, your Range Reef Resources, your Pioneers, all these, your Murphy Oils, all these companies have tremendous reserves relative to their equity market cap. And so what this is setting up for is one of the most impressive, most historic regime changes where the oil majors that are generating tons of free cash flow, because of all the legal constraints that you just described, that, that your, your program's been describing for years, uh, for the last two years at least, because I, I listen to, the, to the, the, this podcast uh, on a regular basis. And what you've been pounding home is, yeah, this it's much more difficult to, to, to actually go out and get the legal authority to go find these new reserves. So we're setting up for a massive uh, consolidation in, in the energy space that, that is going to have, it's setting up for an incredible opportunity for our, for our listeners and our investors. So your hypothesis is that what's going to happen is the majors are going to acquire the smaller companies because that's accretive to them. Essentially, if the market is paying a share price, which is effectively a multiple on reserves, and that's what the majors are getting, then if they acquire miners that have a smaller share cost per unit of reserves, they're going to get paid the higher amount once they become part of a major. Is that the, the gist of it? And does that mean that we get a consolidation to where there's just two or three oil companies that buy up everything what happens next well that's it um but i want you to think about what a moment we just went through you know pioneer exxon exxon 
is your Goldman Sachs of energy. Exxon is your Apple of energy, right? So this is an, if, if Exxon is looking at Pioneer, which just hit the tape over the last week, um, you know, many news reports that talk about the two companies uh, in discussions. This tells us this is a marquee moment where Exxon is. You remember the after after the great financial crisis, Exxon did that XTO transaction, right? And so when someone like Exxon Mobil comes in and makes a transaction of this scale, which would be the largest potential uh, transaction in merger and acquisition since that famous XTO transaction in, uh, just after the 2009 financial crisis, it's, it's the big domino. It's the big kahuna. It's Exxon coming in. And when once they come in, in which I, I think we think they're doing, it reprices the whole market. So now, to your the point that you just made very brilliantly, Eric, is that so when you're in when you're in a, when you're in a, a non M and A regime, all of a sudden year by year, month by month, a lot of those assets, a lot of those assets start to trade very those incredible reserves start to trade over time very very cheap to the market capitalization of the equities. So Southwestern Energy, SWN, or Range Resources. These companies are trading extremely cheap to their reserves. And that's what happens when you go through a long period without a big transaction. But once uh, you get someone like Exxon coming into the market, it's like a marquee name game changer. And it changes the way everybody looks at these companies. So do I understand correctly, Larry, that what you're doing now as a strategy is buying up companies for which the market is paying a relatively small premium uh, per unit of reserves? And the, the arbitrage is essentially get reserves on the cheap because you know those companies are going to be acquired? Yes, exactly. Get the reserves on the cheap. Um, David Einhorn, Greenlight Capital, he's been very public. A number of hedge funds are looking at this kind of relationship between reserves and market cap. And we have our, in the Bear Traps Report, we have trade alerts that we've been building a position in uh, in Antero, AR, and Southwestern Energy. We're looking at range. We're looking at Chesapeake. But we have, we, we positioned our wealth management clients and our family offices in these names in anticipation of, of a big move like this. And and we think that, that it's that's here. And we also had another transaction in the last couple of weeks, uh, OVB equity, which is uh, Ovintiv, um, and, and NCAP. Uh, that was a, a Permian property uh, that was acquired for $4.3 billion. So we definitely have the first couple of dominoes, and, and that's what creates a whole new game changer in the way, in terms, in terms of the way the sell side or the banks uh, start to look at these at these companies. Larry, when you talk about the companies with cheaper reserves being acquired or becoming acquisition targets, is that just a U.S. phenomenon or is it global? And specifically, what I'm really asking is, will there be a preference on, okay, in a friendly jurisdiction, you know, with inside the United States, we know what our laws are going to be. Whereas if you're buying oil producing assets in Guyana or someplace, you never know what the, the rules are going to be. How does uh, national geography and jurisdiction come into the the analysis of this coming consolidation or acquisition trend that you see on the horizon? Well, I did a I did a speech in Brazil six months ago, and I got invited to the office of Andre Estefes, who is a CEO of BTG Pactual, brilliant guy, worth about you know billionaire, worth about eighteen billion, one of the best investors in all of Latin America, all of the world. And um, he had read my book, A Colossal Fair of Common Sense, the Lehman book. And I didn't realize he was a fan. I was, I was invited to a private meeting in his office. And I, I was really impressed with him. And, and for the first question I, I asked him, I, I said, what does BTG stand for? And he sat back in his chair and, and laughed. He said, better than Goldman. <laughs> it's a very interesting guy. But, but one of the points he, he made, which struck with me to this day, is that in this new multipolar world, the whole east-west supply chain dynamic that took place after, think of the Vietnam War. So we had the Cold War 
in, in obviously 40, 50s, 1960s, 1970s. After the Vietnam War, the, the Cold War dissipated and it opened up this incredible period of global history and finance where the east-west supply chains from, from the United States to China through much of Asia, in terms of, you know, in terms of the U.S., in terms of the planet, the U.S. had a lot of allies and there wasn't this, this multipolar adversarial backdrop that's, that's developing. So you could have much, you could have just in time, uh, just in time trade in terms of uh, your supply chains. And what Andre talked to me about was he thinks that in the United States, in, in, in this hemisphere between the U.S., Mexico, uh, in Brazil and much of Latin America, you're going to have an east, a north-south supply chain that's going to back up uh, the major east-west. But he also talked about U.S. companies uh, in the energy space, in investments. And we talked about what we're talking about now, where if you're a U.S. company today, you're Chevron or Exxon, you want to have more U.S. or friendly, what we call friend-shoring assets, friend-shoring assets, where you make investments in, in areas that give you secure assets. It's, you want to have much more secure reserves, right? Whereas in the in the in, in the in the peace dividend coming out of Vietnam, uh, companies felt pretty comfortable, you know, in the eighties and nineties, even early two thousands, about making more global investments. So the tensions between the United States and Russia and China and this new multipolar world are setting up a much more friend-shoring dynamic, which I think, and, and at the Bear Traps, Bear Traps Report and our clients and our institutional chat, this is where we're getting some of these ideas from hedge funds and asset managers around the world, there's going to be a much more premium that's going to come into uh, rare earth companies, oil companies, metals and mining, companies that have the right assets in this hemisphere. It seems to me that we've got to return to the de-dollarization topic that everybody seems to want to dismiss. At least that's been my experience. I started writing more than a decade ago about Sergei Glazyev and his de-dollarization campaign, and everybody used to just laugh at me. Well, now we've gotten to the point where there are a lot of countries around the world making agreements to settle their oil trades, not in U.S. dollars, but in their local currencies. And, of course, the significance of that is if they're not using U.S. dollars, then we no longer create the artificial demand, the international demand for the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency. And that has potentially staggering implications for the U.S. economy. Are we finally at the point where de-dollarization matters? Well, if you think of, you know, you think of like the transactions over the last couple of months, we've seen the first LNG transaction, I believe, between France and, and China, liquefied natural gas, um, where, where, where they're doing a transaction that's outside of the dollar regime. And so we're seeing more and more of these transactions. And, and one of the themes in, in, our, in, in our next book, uh, our first book was about the Lehman crisis, and our next book is about this global multipolar dynamic. But if, if you take sanctions and you, you know, your sanctions weapons aggressively should be used once every decade. But over the last 15 years, both Democrats and Republicans administrations have used the sanction weapon fairly violently across a lot of chunks of emerging markets. So we're incentivizing this, this behavior away from dollars, for sure. And then when it comes to LNG and the, and the war in, in Russia, you know, another, another thing that gets us excited about, about the energy trade is you're talking about right now, in terms of global exports of LNG, you're going from 12 billion cubic feet to 30 billion cubic feet of exports to uh, Europe. And so that's a whole new demand engine. And so you're right, this, this de-dollarization trend is, is in its early innings. And I, I, there's a trend that's going to just keep driving and driving and driving. The U.S. needs to use LNG and its strength in this area in terms of exports to protect the dollar the best they can, because even in this regime, we're already seeing transactions done in LNG away from dollars. 
Well, Larry, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. But before I let you go, I want to come back to the book. Your first book was a terrific success. It was, of course, The Colossal Failure of Common Sense. It was about the Lehman Crisis. You're working on another book. You just alluded a little bit to what it's about. Give us the full story. Why a new book now? What's it about? Who's it for? Well, it's really I want to connect with uh, younger investors that are looking at the previous decade and versus the next 10 years. And so there's a lot of people that are really complacent around sustained inflation. Uh, there's really a universal belief that inflation is going to normalize back under 2%, go back to 1%. And so one of the things we talk about in the book is that when you had the Lehman crisis, Eric, the Lehman crisis, you had a sovereign solution. So the sovereign bailout of all the big banks, right? And then with the COVID crisis, uh, the Lehman crisis ended up being a 2.5 trillion fiscal and monetary response to the Lehman crisis. That was a 2.5 trillion fiscal and monetary response. The COVID crisis was a $10 trillion fiscal and monetary response, which bailed out the lockdowns in the United States. And the suppression of economic activity that we needed, to, that the government wanted to put forth to protect society from the COVID uh, variants and the like. But so, so you're talking about a much, you know, much bigger fiscal and monetary response. And now, over the last year and a half, you've got a lot of these energy bills that have been piling up in Europe and in the United States, and you've got a much, you've got a big bailout, once again, a sovereign bailout of energy bills in, uh, around the world, which is supporting the, the, the energy prices because you're not allowing the market to really take care of uh, high oil prices around the world. Uh, the Europeans, uh, Mario Draghi took, took hundreds of billions of dollars and, is, and is, is basically providing that capital to voters, which are in some respects, you know, paying the energy bills. So so we've had these these sovereign bailouts that have been rolling around the planet for the last um, you know, 14, 15 years. And it creates a whole new dynamic around where inflation is going to normalize. And like you said, the dynamic around the dollar and, and the fact that more countries are moving away from the dollar as the reserve currency and, and the fact that the Fed may get forced into some type of of QE, QT, all of this sets up for a weaker dollar regime, well, not a dollar crash, but a regime where you have a planet Earth that's in a rebalancing where as an investor listening to us right now, you're going to want to have a, a portfolio that's much more focused on value stocks, emerging markets, European equities, and hard assets, you know, your gold, your silvers, uh, and your rare earth metals. And Larry, I want to touch on the Bear Traps report itself, which is spectacularly popular in the industry. You were kind enough to extend an offer, which uh, subscribers will find in your Research Roundup email. You'll find a link for a free trial of the Bear Traps report. Tell us a little bit more about it. Well, I'm really proud, Eric. You know, the last I started off on the retail side of the business and uh, as, a, as a financial advisor in the 90s. And over the years, I spent most of my career on the institutional side, working um, at Lehman and, and, and SockGen, and now part of the Bear Traps platform. So most of our, 80% of our revenue is from your hedge funds, your pension funds, your mutual funds, your real asset managers that are on the buy side. They're professional investors. But what we've, what we've done is we want to give the retail investor or the family office, or, or your listeners, uh, a lens on that buy side conversation. So I think it's important that people listening to us right now understand. You know, forget about the banks sometimes because the banks have the banks are axed. So your major banks, whether it be you know Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or or any any one of the big banks, they're typically axed to have a view, and uh, there's biases that are involved there. What we try to do is. We want to give clients a lens on, okay, what are the professionals really thinking about? Where, where are we allocating capital? And where, you know, where is our highest conviction trades? Uh, and and that's, that's what we're focused on. And it's a very, it's, it's a very rewarding process. 
And again, listeners, you'll find a link in your Research Roundup email for a free trial of the Bear Traps Report. Patrick Ceresna, Nick Larnick, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, great interview with Larry. Now, joining us again in the post-game segment is Nick Galarnik. Now, let's get to the chart deck. Listeners, you'll find the download link for the post-game chart deck in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, it means you have not yet registered at MacroVoices.com. Just go to our homepage, MacroVoices.com, and click on the red button over Larry's picture that says, Looking for the Downloads. All right, Eric, let's cover crude oil, starting with that EIA inventory. EIA printed a drawdown of 597,000 barrels, so another draw, but not nearly as big as the last couple of weeks. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 409,000 barrels. Gasoline, drawing down 331,000 barrels. Distillates, drawing down 606,000 barrels. So all the numbers on the board are less than a million barrels this week. U.S. production ticked up 100,000 barrels to 12.3 million barrels. Now, that is a post-COVID. Uh, record high. We first got up to 12.3, I forget how many months ago, and we've been kind of on a plateau between 12.2 and 12.3 for several months. Are we finally going to move higher, or has U.S. production peaked already at 12.3? I'm going to be watching closely in coming weeks as to whether or not we can move above this number, which so far has been a ceiling uh, in terms of U.S. production. Moving on to the bigger picture of where the market is headed, I had been expecting or perhaps hoping for a gap fill back down to $75 uh, before the OPEC news came out. Instead, we just broke above the initial trading range that was established after the uh, the gap up as a result of that news from OPEC. Uh, I think the recession news is still set to worsen, so that could spell lower prices, but it also looks like China's getting serious about reopening stimulus. So maybe the that story that uh, I had been expecting several months ago is finally starting to play out in terms of a China-led oil demand recovery. Let's wait and see what the next few weeks bring, though, because one print certainly does not make a new trend. Yeah, Eric, it's interesting on that chart, uh, the fact that the gap didn't fill. I continue to uh, have the uh, volume profiling on the chart on page two, and it really shows, you know, through December and uh, all the way through early March, we had a very decisive trade range, which captured a very large amount of volume by price. And uh, the gap higher on the reaction to OPEC plus uh, blew through some very heavy overhead resistance. And the fact that now we've actually broken uh, above that area and attempting to break at all of those January highs uh, really uh, puts oil in an interesting scenario where above the 200 day moving averages, the 50 day moving averages, breaking to higher highs. At this point, there is uh, so long as this doesn't immediately fade on some sort of bad news that reverses the trend, which is always a risk. But right now, purely from just with the technical level and the way it's behaving, there's not much stopping oil from making advance uh, towards you know, 88 to $90, where uh, were the kind of uh, upper boundary levels in October and November that captured a lot of that trade range. Right now, crude oil is definitely feeling uh, rather bullish. Anyway, let's get to equities. Uh, Nick, on uh, page three, we've got that S&P 500, when, when we're and talking about some of the support resistance levels. What are the option levels and what are you watching here? Spot right now is about 40, 90, uh, 4,100 or so. PPI just dropped and uh, the report came out at a 0.5% uh, decline month over month versus a flat reading expected. So that's bullish news for the markets. Right now, we still have that call wall at 4,150, put walls at 3,800. Uh, implied move for the April 21st OPEX, which is next Friday's OPEX, is about plus minus 70 points. Upside would be 4160, downside 4020 or so, with key resistance at 4150 and 4200 then. And then on the downside, key support is at 4050 and then 4000. I'm thinking we keep on pushing toward the upside in a gradual fashion into next Friday's OPEX. Thereafter, we see volatility spike into the FOMC meeting, which is the first week of May. And after that, I think we're going to see some more declines um, in the broad markets as volatility picks up. 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that. Uh, I overall uh, agree with a lot of your views. I mean, the first thing to observe is that here on the FOMC uh, meeting minutes that just came out with the CPI, uh, the market attempted to retest those February and uh, uh, and late March highs and uh, failed to break out to the upside. But yet the technical trend is still definitively bullish, uh, very similar to uh, what, what we were talking about with crude. Uh, we're above all the key moving averages. Uh, the pattern of higher lows and higher highs and old dips being bought uh, remains intact. At this moment, uh, with uh, us past many of the major news hurdles, it, it, uh, the path of least resistance is the S&P to go higher. The only thing that really is interesting in my mind is uh, will the when we get into the pig in the python moment of earnings, which is coming up in the coming weeks, uh, could there be a series? of earnings disappointments that uh, take the wind out of the sails of this market. That's all speculation at this moment. So right now, I'm going to be watching whether or not that S&P can break uh, those February highs that would pr- target something towards uh, um, the 4,300 area. And we'll certainly be watching what the reactions are going to be when we get to some of those key earnings moving forward. Let's move on, though, to the NASDAQ. And we'll have on page five the QQQs. Uh, what are the technical levels you're watching here, bud? Spot right now is 312 approximately. Uh, call wall above at 350, put wall below at 270. Implied move for next Friday's OPEX again, April 21st, is plus minus eight points. Upper expected move around 320, which is also resistance, and lower expected move of 304 approximately. Um, supports also at 300. Key resistance, as I mentioned before, is 320, and key support at 300. Given that we have earnings coming up the next couple of weeks and the big tech names, I do see potential for bullish catalyst, not in terms of the earnings being bullish, but I think the market expects such negative earnings that if they surprise and come in as expected, we may get a bullish move in names like Google, Microsoft, Apple, for example. I'm most bearish on Apple right now, and I'm bullish on Google and Microsoft primarily. But uh, I do think we're going to see more upside perhaps in the short term. And as I said, as we approach the FOMC event after earnings um, start passing by, we're going to see more volatility pick up, in my opinion, and uh, also we're going to see a decline in broad markets in the medium term. Right. And so let's move on to page six, where we have that volatility index. And what we uh, what was interesting, obviously, in the first reaction to uh, the regional bank crisis, the implied vols uh, spiked even to 30 on a intraday basis and looked like a risk premium was having to be priced back in as everyone was uh, concerned and hedging and paying any cost of doing so. And it's amazing how here going into April, we just completely mean reverted right back down to those January in February lows. Uh, I don't, personally, I'm uh, not thinking that uh, volatility has much more downside and therefore generally buying Vega here seems to be asymmetric in my mind. What's, uh, what's your thinking here on the VIX? Yeah, I've said in the past that this area below 20 is pretty supportive overall. Uh, once we get above that area and push 25, then there's a possible catalyst to go to 35, but usually you need some kind of um, news event to induce that. So right now, I think we're in a holding pattern until next week's OPEX, because right now there's a lot of cash on the the sidelines, and uh, there's not much hedging going on in terms of put buying out of the money. Um, So I think we're going to see the volatility pick up after next Friday's OPEX. And again, we have FOMC the first week of May, which will be a volatility-inducing event. Uh, If they do raise rates again, the market will probably get spooked, and if they don't discuss even cutting rates, which you know a lot of markets, uh, market participants are, are predicting, that will probably spook the markets as well and push us down below that four thousand level. Now, on page seven here, we have the U.S. dollar index. What are you guys thinking here? We're hugging along right at the bottom of the consolidation zone, which means maybe we're getting set up to uh, break lower and, and establish a new downtrend. But that hasn't happened yet. We'd still need a daily close below 100 to really seal the deal on dollar weakness. Until then, we're just consolidating at the bottom of the consolidation zone. Yeah, it's interesting, Eric. Uh, th- those lows there uh, near February, around this 101 level, uh, are obviously uh, the U.S. dollar is approaching them. But uh, what's really important to note is that the euro and the pound sterling both have broken those January highs. Uh, today, we have the euro trading above the 110 level. And so uh, at this moment, a uh, follow through of the euro to 112 is possible. So seeing that dollar in 
index temporarily trade down to 100 is, uh, in my mind, the path of least resistance, even though it has not yet broken that lower low on, on the dollar index. But uh, I am not so sure that some big new U.S. dollar decline is, uh, is imminent. I, uh, I'm highly suspect that uh, inevitably when this exo- the selling here exhausts itself, we'll see it come right back into that trade range. And, uh, and it'll be probably a much more muddled currency market going into the summer. But uh, that's my early speculation. It probably will break to a little bit of a lower low here. But uh, I, um, at this moment, am uh, not uh, really outright bearish uh, the dollar here. Let's move on to page eight, where we have the gold futures chart. Now, we're pushing near all-time highs, and it looks like we're going to break out to the upside. Uh, But what are you guys thinking here? What we're seeing here is a classic textbook pattern of technical analysis, where we had a round number resistance level at 2,000, struggled to get through that, finally broke through 2,000, quickly up to 2040 or so, 2040. Uh, Then we went in a very classic pattern back to test that same 2,000 round number, but this time as support rather than resistance. Held up nicely, traded only for a few minutes below 2,000, got down to, I think, 1990 or something like that. And then back up now as I'm recording now, I'm looking at 2031. So we're most of the way back up to where it had been before correcting. And it's also held up nicely. It was obviously a big knee jerk day up and down with the CPI print on Wednesday. But you know, at the end of the day, we we're about where we started and still moving up. So the outlook still looks good. The question though is, is it going to take a week to get to new all time highs or is it going to take six months? I, I'd say that's anyone's guess. I'm leaning toward it taking at least a month or two of consolidation at the top of the trading range before a breakout begins to new all-time highs. Uh, I could be wrong. If it happens sooner, that's even more bullish. But uh, I'm, I'm not expecting that. We've seen a really great run so far. I think the market needs to take a breath before it can power through that very formidable resistance at the previous all-time highs around 2080, 2080. Yeah, you know, Eric, uh, what, uh, one of the things that uh, I look at at gold is that 2000 was such a psychological number, even though the two previous highs were a little bit higher near the 2080 level. But uh, when uh, gold's trading above 2000, it gets a lot of press, and gets a lot of attention, and a lot of traders start allocating more there. And it's clearly been the driver of this uh, immediate trend. The fact also that the US dollar remains weak remains a further tailwind to allow this to keep going. If we do break uh, this 2050 level where the high came in the other week, it uh, leaves the window open for uh, a solid $100 advance to the uh, 2100 to 2150, which would be an all-time high. And if that uh, was uh, to hit the tape, it'll be certainly a a big frenzy amongst the media talking about gold at all-time new highs. Uh, It'll be really interesting to see whether or not that gets faded or whether that actually gives even further life to gold gold uh, going higher. It'll be a very interesting next week or two in that. Anyway, I wanted to just leave it uh, with just touching on the 10-year treasury yields, uh, which I have on uh, page nine. And uh, we've been more or less trading around this uh, uh, 340-point level uh, more or less for a week. And it's where all the December and January and early February uh, lows came in on the yield. But uh, right now, inflation continues to come in generally the economy is weakening. Uh, I don't necessarily see any reason why yields should have a reason in the most immediate move uh, to head back to 4%. And uh, so the big question in my mind is, uh, will there uh, be some sort of disappointing news that comes out in the weeks to come that potentially has uh, the 10-year punching down to 3% and maybe even going back to the August lows near 2.5? While we haven't had a definitive break down of that level, uh, I don't really see that much reason for this to go higher. So uh, it'll be one of those things to watch week over week as to when something like that develops. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one-stop shop for all green energy investors. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's Research Roundup. 
On this week's Research Roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the chart book we just discussed here in the post game, and a number of links to articles that we found interesting. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that is Eric spelled with a K, and follow Patrick at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Serezna, and myself, thanks for listening, and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.